Hey, what's up? Today I'm going to be filming a video to teach you how you can make your ex fall in love with you. So before I start teaching you what you need to do to make your ex fall in love with you, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to recommend that you stop by our website and take our ex recovery chances quiz. I want you to get a clear idea of if this process is even worth your time. The worst thing that can happen is you to start this process only to realize you don't want them back. So if you stop by our website, you'll take our free quiz and we'll give you an idea of what kind of chance you have of getting your ex back. So if you haven't already, go to exboyfriendrecovery.com, find our quiz and take it. If you want a quick shortcut, simply look in the description of this video and click on that link and it'll take you right there. Let's begin. What if I were to tell you that there are 11 things that you can do to make your ex fall in love with you? Now that sounds too good to be true, right? Well, actually it's not. Scientists have identified 11 things that you can do to make your ex fall in love with you. So what I'm gonna do for you is hop on downstairs, kind of like a bunny, and fire up my computer pull up my slides and actually show you these 11 things step by step so you know exactly what you can do to raise the chances of making your ex fall in love with you. So whenever I've given a presentation, uh, usually it's like a two hour long presentation to people, this is the part of the presentation that I'm about to show you right here that people just fall in love with because I don't think they've ever heard anything like this before. I'm hoping that you have never heard anything like this before. And that is how do you make someone fall in love with you? I mean, if we all had the power to make whoever we wanted to fall in love with us, we would probably <laughs> be walking around with the person of our dreams, right? So hopefully by after watching this small presentation that I'm about to play for you or about to teach you, you're going to be able to have that ability. So the first thing I need to get you to do is understand that the way that you've been thinking about love is absolutely completely wrong. So what you need to understand is that love is nothing more than a set of chemicals released by the brain, right? There's the picture of me there, you know, with the in the head, that's because in my head, the brain releases these chemicals, and after these chemicals are released, it makes me feel, hey, I'm in love. And here are some of the chemicals that get released by the brain. Dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, CRF hormone, CRF receptors, vasopressin, all of these things create the feeling of love. So... Really, if we understand love in these terms, it isn't so far-fetched to think that we can actually reverse engineer this entire process and create these chemicals within our exes, right? And so when scientists have studied you know, these chemicals, they found that there's really 11 factors that are commonly linked to these chemicals. Or uh, by doing these 11 things, you can get your brain or get a brain to release these chemicals. So the idea is to do the following things to get your ex, your ex's brain more specifically, to release a certain type of chemical and associate that chemical with you and say, wow, I'm in love with her, right? So here are the 11 factors, similarities, familiarities, desirable characteristics, reciprocation, social influence, fulfilling needs, environment, specific cues or particular features, readiness, alone time, and mystery. Now I'm going to go through each one of these factors for you so that you have kind of a little bit of a foundation to build on. Now, the cool part about this is I'm putting this up on YouTube for you so that you can refer back to this and learn what you need to learn about getting your ex back and making them fall in love with you. So I am going to go fast just because that's sort of how I roll. No worries though. Just know that this is going to be up on YouTube hopefully forever. Hopefully the world doesn't end and YouTube has to go away. So at any point you can kind of pause and take notes and I certainly am going to show you a few people that I've worked with that have taken notes on this exact lecture before. But let's get started. So uh, obviously what I'm going to do now is take a minute and go over what each of these factors quote unquote entails. Right. So let's first uh, look at factor number one, similarities, right? So I have a picture here of uh, a film poster of the movie High Fidelity, right? And there's a there's a quote in that movie that I like to uh, quote on my website and sometimes in my videos all the time. And that's where the main character, Joan, uh, John Cusack, literally says, it's not what you're like, it's what you like. And he's referring to how we can attract someone, right? So what what 
scientists so basically what he is saying in the film I'll hold the science he talk for a minute you know for a minute but basically in the film what he's saying is that the more similar two people are the more drawn they are going to be together now that sounds kind of uh, flies in the face of everything that Hollywood typically tells us which is opposites attract and blah 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 well actually when scientists look at what factors really are present in love similarities came up so actually the more you can highlight the similarities that you have with your ex the better right so that's factor number one factor number two is familiarity now familiarity can be anything from spending time together being near each other anticipating interactions with others and really the big takeaway i want you to get here with familiarity is that you're just not going to fall in love with someone that you really met two minutes ago right science does not back up love at first sight not to say that it can't happen look i'm i'm of the belief that there's no such thing as facts until it can be scientifically disproven right but even then there's some wiggle room there and i don't want to get into philosophical debates with anyone but look Generally speaking, you're going to fall in love with someone who you feel familiar with. So this is actually why when we teach our process, half of the battle is actually kind of getting back into that pattern of where you're talking to each other again. Why? Because we're trying to create that familiarity. We're trying to create a pattern where you and your ex are going to be talking constantly and be familiar with one one another, right? So that's kind of a cool thing. So let's move on to factor number three, three out of 11. Number three is desirable characteristics, right? So this one's pretty self-explanatory, right? Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So each person has a unique look that they like or characteristic of the opposite sex that they like. And this, I don't know why I picked this picture to be quite honest with you. Um, but I guess what I'm trying to go for here is that some men, if you're trying to get them back, are all about looks. Some men are all about humor, right? It really depends on your ex and what they sort of like. So the more you can highlight whatever desirable characteristics that you know that your ex, let's say that your ex, and I do know, I hope Anna, my uh, one of the coaches that uh, I work with, doesn't mind me using her as an example, but Anna is currently engaged and her fiance has a thing for women with kind of large lips, right? And so Anna was blessed with these really awesome large lips. And so what she does is she tries to highlight them with different lipsticks and lip gloss. And I'm definitely the worst person to be talking about this because uh, I am like downright like know nothing about like how beauty or how, how to look how like a woman makes herself look beautiful. But one thing she, I do know she does, and she has told this on story in, in stories, I think in this exact presentation before is that she highlights her lips, right? So if you can highlight those desirable characteristics, more power to you. Factor number four is reciprocation. And so really the cool thing, I put kind of a scale together here because I wanted to show you in my opinion, what we end up having is kind of two ends of the spectrum. So most of the clients that I work with either reciprocated a little too much. And by reciprocation, I mean, uh, I love you. And then they, let's say, let's say your ex shows some type of interest, right? And the woman just goes crazy with it and sort of like looks at engagement rings and pushes things. That's reciprocating too much. And then of course we have the other end of the spectrum where you get women sometimes who fall in love with the no contact rule and decide, hey, I'm never going to contact my ex unless he contacts me first and just sticks to it. Well, they're not reciprocating enough. What you're looking for is to have a perfect amount of reciprocation, a, a true 50-50 split where he's bringing up half the conversations and you're bringing up half the conversations. He's responding to his half of the conversation and you're responding to your half of the conversation. Now, nothing's ever perfect in this world, but what you are always trying to attain is that perfect type of reciprocation. This is backed up by science because again, I didn't just pull these out of, of I almost said, I don't pull these out of my butt. I didn't just pull these out and say, Hey, these are the 11 factors of love. No, these are all backed by science. People a lot smarter than me found these. Okay. So number five is social influence. This is pretty, this, I think this is kind of an interesting thing that's often overlooked, right? I see this a lot in age gaps, right? The social influence of the age gap. For example, Let's say there's a 10 year age gap, the uh, or maybe let's make it even crazier, 28 year age gap, right? You've got a 40 year old man and a 20 year old woman. 
The 20-year-old woman's trying to get the man back, but the man, all of his friends, family, all the people surrounding him are saying, why are you dating that young jailbait girl or something like that, right? So the social influence, the, the people around your ex that he surrounds himself with and who he views as his world, if they're applying pressure and saying this person is negative, it can have an impact. And it can also have the opposite impact, right? If all the people around him are saying this is the best thing that ever happened to you, it makes him feel good and he's like likely going to be more drawn to you. Then we have factor number six, fulfilling needs. Again, this one's not really, not too deep. I can go into this one because fulfilling needs is just like it says, right? The more you mutually fulfill each other's needs, the more you're going to love each other, right? So fulfilling needs kind of works. Factor number seven is environment. This is kind of something that I don't think gets talked about a lot. And I think it definitely 100% has a huge impact into how we fall in love with someone. So I'll give you an example. One of the most popular shows right now is The Bachelor. You get one very, very good looking man and you have 30 women competing to win this man's a tr- you know, attention essentially. And they take these women on the most incredible dates you can think of, the most incredible environments you can think of, the most romantic environments you can think of. And then we ask ourselves, why would she fall in love with a man who's dating 30 other women? Well, it's because in the moment when they have alone time together, they are in the most romantic environment you can imagine. And that has an impact on how we feel, right? So environment can really play a role into how your ex feels about you. And this is something that a lot of my clients ask me about, specifically when it comes to sealing the deal of getting a commitment, right? The worst thing you can do is take your ex to McDonald's and say, hey, let's be boyfriend and girlfriend again. No, The best thing you could do is take your ex out on a very romantic getaway and then pop that question because that's going to be more likely to get a yes. Why? The environment is different. Um, And I guess I'll go a little bit deeper. So this is going to be kind of a personal story. But today, for example, uh, we've been trying to find ways to get my little two-year-old daughter to get her energy out, right? Because we can't just stand sitting inside all day. So what we decide to do is to take her to the park sometimes, but that can even get boring. So all we did today was simply take her to another park, a different, uh, same park, same type of park, different environment, different location. That location was enough to excite her and tire her out, right? So environment really plays a role into how we feel about things, even to a two-year-old. So number eight is specific cues or a particular feature. So these are the specific, this is kind of just really kind of very similar to the desirable characteristics factor that we were talking about. I believe that was factor number three. This one is honing in on specifically what your ex kind of has an inkling for, right? So uh, for Anna, it would actually be those lips, right? So for some people, it will be, hey, you have the bluest eyes. Oh, you have the best smile. Oh, you have the cutest crinkle in your nose. The more you highlight those things, the better. And yes, you you get the picture. Factor number nine is another really important factor that you need to sort of take into account. Readiness. How ready is your ex to fall in love with you? Timing is super important here. So this is the part that I think I lose a lot of people right? So not a lot of people realize that, but this is why the no contact rule exists, right? It's, it exists to, so the no contact rule, in my opinion, one of the most primary reasons for why it works and why it's so effective is that it really works on a level that uh, helps you position yourself better, right? Because when we often break up with someone, we are not positioned properly in their mind, right? So the no contact rule helps with positioning, but it also helps with readiness and timing, right? So the more uh, time goes by, there's kind of like a triangle. And if I could kind of graph this out, that would be great. But obviously, you're just gonna have to kind of imagine it for now. But it's kind of like a triangle. The more time goes by at first, the better your chances are. But 
if it becomes too long, the worse your chances get. So there is kind of like a window of time where you're at, your chances are going to be the highest. And it's up to you to position yourself as high as you possibly can and then hit so that the timing is right. And factor number 10, alone time. Again, not much I can really elaborate on here, but you do need your one-on-one -on -one time. This is why we have dates structured into our program. And finally, mystery. Now, I'm going to go on a little bit of a talk here, but uh, really what we're looking for here is uh, mystery. And mystery is nothing more than not knowing what the other person is thinking. It's nothing more than a lack of information. And I think it's important to understand the actual definition of mystery because a lot of people don't know how to create that mystery. Well, mystery is also synonymous with kind of adventurous, right? Because it, uh, adventurous, uh, spontaneous, uh, these are the exact opposite of someone who's very stable. Right. And so oftentimes we have this conflicting need of wants. We we want someone who's mysterious and adventurous and exciting. We also want someone who's stable and reliable and things like that. And they conflict. And so what I find a lot of clients who come to me, they usually fall in one end of the spectrum. They usually fall in the crazy, mysterious, adventurous, exciting category or the super stable kind of boring category. Is one better than the other? Absolutely not. That's that's a common misconception. Every girl wants to be the mysterious girl, but I actually think stability is a stronger place to start off with because someone who's very mysterious and adventurous and spontaneous has more trouble being stable, in my opinion, just because by nature they like to go out and be on the move and be in, in, in motion, essentially. And someone who's stable... It's easier to be mysterious and spontaneous if you're stable versus the opposite sort of way. So I think what we're what my point here is that you need to have both in a relationship. So I, I imagine a lot of you listening to this, if you've listened this far, hey, what's up? Thank you so much for listening this far. If you've listened this far, you may be sitting there and thinking to yourself, you know what? I was kind of the stable one in the relationship. I didn't do enough spontaneous or mysterious or adventurous things for my ex. Well, now you know what you need to work on, right? And speaking of what you should work on, here's kind of a little bit of homework to end this video, right? What I want you to do is take out a sheet of paper, rewatch this video, and make a list of the areas of quote unquote love that you can improve on, right? So someone in our private Facebook group, and if you if you have if you're not in our private Facebook group, get in the private Facebook group. Ask me in the comments, and I'll ho I'll hook you up with the proper link. But someone in our Facebook group, after I did this exact lecture for them got out a piece of paper and did this exact exercise. You could see what this person decided that they needed to work on and what they decided they didn't need to work on. Yep, that's it. 